move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. Question one has been withdrawn. Aaron Sir Oliver McMullen. Can I have ever a all question to I call Stuart Dixon to answer question two on behalf of the Assembly Commission. Um, Principal Libby Speaker and uh, Mr McMullen, thank you for your question. The Assembly Commission's uh, Good Relations Action Plan 2016-2021 was agreed by the Commission in October and includes an action to agree a languages policy in 2017. That action was carried forward into the Good Relations Action Plan 2016-21 from the previous action plan which covered the period 2012-16. In November 2012. Following consultation with political parties, the Commission was, was considering a draft languages policy and associated guidance. However, the Commission was unable to reach political consensus on the matter in the last mandate. At its September meeting, the Commission requested a paper on the languages policy to be presented to it in January 2017. Secretarial uh, uh, officials are currently preparing this paper, and once the Commission has had the opportunity to consider the matter and agree a way forward on languages, the detail will then be developed. The development process will include consultation with relevant stakeholders, including members, political parties and staff. Oliver McMullen for a supplementary. I could, and can I thank the member for his, his answer? But can I, can I ask the member, um, what is the Commission doing to fulfil its, uh, its obligations under the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages? Uh, I'd like to, to thank the, the member for, for his, his supplementary question. The Commission is aware of it, the provisions of the European Charter for Regional uh, and Minority Languages and is represented on the Interdepartmental Charter Implementation Group. Uh, the Commission will consider any guidance that arises from that group. Naomi Long isn't in her place. I call Tom Buchanan. Sure. I call Alec Atwood to answer question four on behalf of the Assembly Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam De Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank the member for his question. I hope he doesn't press me on the technical details. Uh, in 2011, the Assembly Commission procured and installed its own dedicated internet connection in order to provide better and more consistent access to the internet for all Parliament building users. The service was originally provisioned at 20 megabyte, megabits per second. Uh, due to increasing demand, it was increased to 40 in February 2013. And then in September 2014, a further additional line was installed to provide resilience. And at this time, the line speed was increased to 80 megabits overall. So three times since 2011, there has been an upgrade in the service provided. Um, since this new connection in 2014, the Assembly has benefited from significant bandwidth, in additional bandwidth and uh, uh, IS staff proactively monitor the status. At present, the Assembly Commission and the IS office is not aware of any major problems with the internet in the building, although there will be surges in use at various times. Uh, at one stage, there might be up to 900 different users uh, on the internet at one time in the building, and that might cause momentary or transitional difficulties, but according to the Commission and the IAS Office, there is no major reason for concern as far as we're aware. Tom Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank the member for his uh, answer. I, I, I appreciate what the member is saying, but I think members are still finding that at lunch times, speeds are still very slow, and maybe that is something that uh, could be addressed. Um, uh, yes, as I indicated in my initial reply, uh, during peak hours and on sitting days, especially around uh, lunchtime when people are uh, about the building more, there can be in excess of 900 devices ranging from traditional PCs to smart phones and other devices accessing the Wi-Fi, and that surge may create some uh, reduction in speed. However, uh, the Commission will keep this under review because the current contract allows for an increase of a further 20 megabits, and if the Commission determines, informed by the members, that they need to go in that direction, I'm sure the Commission will be found wanting. I call Alan Chambers for supplementary. 
Uh, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Commissioner uh, provide an update on the engagement with mobile phone networks in relation to improving uh, phone signals in much of Parliament buildings? Uh, uh, certainly in my lifetime on the Commission, which hasn't been very short, that matter hasn't been flagged up to us at a Commission level. It may have been flagged up to uh, management. If so, I'll get a response to the member. If it hasn't been flagged up either to management or to the Commission, I'm sure both of us will look at it. I'm sorry, Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. Oh, good. <coughs> Excuse me. Could you update us on what the cost would be to the Assembly to increase the connection capacity? Uh, I, I, I'll get back to the member in terms of what the cost might be. As I indicated in uh, the supplementary answer, there is a provision within the current contract uh, to, for a further upgrade of 20 to 100 megabits. Um, the cost, I am sure, is part of the contract, but the precise amount I'll come back to the member on. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the member, given the fact that we have businesses that have in excess of 1,000 or 1,500 devices being used on internet with superfast broadband, um, what the Commission has considered the impact is of low internet connectivity speeds and setting days for the ability of members to research for debates? Uh, uh, I'm sure all members of the Commission will hear what the member is saying. As I say, there hasn't been uh, much evidence to the Commission that there's a big problem. Yes, we recognise that there are surges in use and that might slow down connectivity. But as far as I'm aware, informed by management in the building, we aren't aware that there's a major concern. However, uh, the fact that four members have so far asked, asked questions this afternoon in relation to this matter and no supplementaries in relation to the first question, I think members must be flagging this up to the Commission. I think the Commission should look at it. I call William Irwin. Question number five. Stuart Dixon to answer question number five. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Irwin, for your question. Uh, between uh, the 29th of November 2015 and the 28th of November 2016, the Education Service provided programmes to 17 schools from the Newry and Armagh constituency. Some 661 participants took part in the programmes. The Education Service delivered programmes to 15,316 young people uh, during this period. The programmes were delivered both in Parliament buildings and in schools. William Irwin for a supplement. I will thank the member for his reply. Uh, what uh, is the promotional aspect in relation to encouraging schools uh, to do educational visits to the Assembly? Chair Dixon. Uh, the Assembly Education Service makes a great deal of contact with schools right across Northern Ireland. At the beginning of every school year, the Education Service sends out letters to all schools explaining the programme and the resources available. Booking information is all ava also available on the Education Service's website, and they daily uh, tweet and use social media and take part in programmes. And there's a new subs subscription service available on the Assembly website, which will allow more direct contact for teachers. Call Danny Kennedy. For uh, his uh, answers uh, thus far, could I ask uh, the member of the Commission what additional measures could be taken to attract? Uh, even more uptake uh, to the excellent education service that is available here in Parliament buildings. And can I give a, a breakdown in, in respect of the Nuri and Armagh figures for the uh, primary and post-primary schools? Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, and thank Mr Kennedy for, for, for his question. Uh, as I've said previously, uh, there is good contact made between all schools in Northern Ireland and the education service, uh, and I genuinely believe that they are fully aware of the programme that's available here, but until they actually avail of it, they will not understand the, the broad ex extent of, of the work that is done. Turning to uh, the constituency of Newry and Armagh, some 72 primary schools and 18 post-primary schools in the Newry and Armagh constituency. Of those schools who were visited during this period, three were primary schools with 95 participants and 14 were post-primary schools with 566 participants. And if I could encourage all members to encourage schools, as and when they visit them, to participate in the Assembly's education programmes. Iram Sir Jerry Kelly, I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, 
Paul Jim Wells to respond to question number six. The Gender Action Plan 2016 to 2018 was approved by the Assembly Commission in March 2016 following staff consultation. It sets out actions and measures to promote gender equality within the Assembly Secretariat and it's broken down into three themes leadership and development, communication and engagement, and life balance, health and well being. A Gender Action Plan Implementation Group, which comprises staff from right across the Secretariat, has been established to oversee the implementation of the plan. The group consists of uh, reports to the Commission every six months on the progress against the targets. An update was presented to the Commission at its November meeting, highlighting progress made since March 2016. These include an update on the Commission's participation in Business in the Community's Gender Project, which includes areas such as equality, organisational policy and personnel issues, and participation by Assembly Commission staff in Women in Public Life programmes. Further action will be rolled out over the, the lifetime of the plan. In terms of senior appointment within the Secretariat, and I'm sure the Honourable Member for North Belfast is aware of this, two out of the five senior posts in the Assembly are held by women, including, of course, our Chief Executive. Uh, there were no females at this level of leadership one year ago. Jerry Kelly for a supplement. Uh, thank the Member for his answer up to now, um, and he, he gave a pretty comprehensive uh, answer to it. But I, I suppose the question that most people ask, because it's obvious the gender balance is not well balanced, is what are the targets? Are there any targets within the plan, within the action plan? And if there are, what way will they be monitored? Well, the, the, the ultimate aim of the plan is to ensure, of course, that we do have gender balance within the Assembly. But I do think the fact that two such important senior posts have recently, on merit, been allocated to women indicates that we are moving very much in the right direction. Uh, some of the problems regarding gender in the Assembly are, are skewed by the fact that most of those who are ushers and security staff are male, and that undoubtedly will skew the overall uh, balance between male and female within the Assembly. But at many levels within this building, uh, women are uh, coming forward for senior positions, and the balance is a good one. What we have decided not against, of course, is any form of quotas. Um, the gender, we did consider this, but in terms of recruitment, it is unlawful to reserve a quota of jobs for members of a particular underrepresented group or disadvantaged group, uh, group. And therefore, we cannot uh, define on the basis of sex, religion, community background, race, or sexual orientation. We cannot define or have quotas for those positions. Aram Sir, Claire Bailey. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, just on the back of the, the, the last response, and thank you for it, um, given that the, the quotas worked very well for the pattern reviews for the police service, um, could we not reconsider the implementation of gender quotas here for the, the Assembly? Jim Wells. Well, well, the Assembly is nowhere near the position that the Royal Ulster Constabulary was at the time that quotas were implemented when it became the PSNI. There's always been a very large proportion, albeit a minority, a large proportion of our staff have been female. And quite frankly, I think many of the, the female members of staff in this building would like to think that they have been appointed entirely on merit rather than because of quotas. And equally, if they're promoted, they would like to think it's done entirely on merit as it is. And the very fact that they keep emphasizing the point is that our most senior member of staff is now a female and one of our top, other top four members of staff are female. That is a very welcome trend, but it's done entirely on the ability of the applicants rather than any fixed quotas or our target set. No point of orders that during question time. I call uh, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, what consideration has the plan given to extra sitting days rather than later sittings when business is heavy, given the impact it has on those of us with childcare issues? Wells. I'm only on the Commission uh, since uh, May. I haven't heard that issue raised um, because, of course, there, there are committee days as well as sitting days, which also place a burden upon staff. I'm certain that the Business Committee, which is really the body that makes decisions on when we meet and at what time would take that issue on board. That's, that is new to me as a Commission member. I, I don't think it actually falls within the remit 
of uh, the Gender Action Plan, but it is an issue that's worth considering. I call Jonathan Bell. Number eight, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, questions 7 and 14 are grouped and will be answered by Alex Maskey. Iram Sir, Alex Maskey. Could I, could I uh, with your permission, then answer both 7 and 14 together? Could I thank members Bell and Logan for their questions? Um, 21 proposals for private members bills have been tabled since May 2016. 19 of these are currently being developed under the private members bill support service provided by the bill office. An additional senior assistant clerk was added to the Bill Office complement prior to the commencement of the new Assembly mandate in response to the increasing demand for support for private members' bills. However, due to the record number of proposals for PMBs received this mandate, a business case has now uh, been put forward for an additional staff resource for this important strand of parliamentary uh, work, and that, as I said, being currently preferred. The Assembly Commission has agreed to make an additional provision of £155,000 in its 2017-2018 budget to respond to pressures on the bill and business offices, including the additional demand for support for PMBs. This amount has already been included in the Commission's budget plans for the next financial year. I call Mr Jonathan Bell for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Apologies, I was questioning it in the topicals before that. Um, can I thank uh, the uh, Commission member for the answer? Can I ask what workforce planning has been undertaken by the Commission? Uh, what their predictions were for the number of private members' bills and what they assessed the capacity uh, of staff required to fulfil those. Thank the member for that. Supplementary, could I perhaps give some background information? On the 19th of September uh, 2016, following receipt by the Bill Office of 19 proposals for PMBs in the first few weeks of the new mandate, the Speaker wrote to the Committee on Procedures advising that he saw the increase in PMBs as a very positive sign and that it would be prudent for the Assembly's current procedures relating to PMBs to be reviewed. Uh, he also indicated that the Bill Office would be unable to support any more PMBs beyond the 19 proposals which have been tabled at the time. And the Committee on Procedures member may be aware has recently agreed the following terms of reference for the review, and these would include to consider the current procedures and systems governing private members' bills in the Assembly, assess the available support and resources for the development of private members' bills in the Assembly, research the procedures governing private members' bills and the support and resource available in other jurisdictions. So you can see from the response that uh, the terms of reference do include uh, the need uh, identified by the Speaker for a, a complete review and overhaul of the need to support the PMBs in the time ahead. I call Philip Logan. Thank you. Uh, would the Commission consider uh, moving resources from uh, areas of, from the Assembly that may be over-resourced into trying to deal with uh, private members' bills? Thank you. Alex Maskey. Thank the member for that supplementary also. The member, as I've said, uh, just uh, pointed out that the, there is a review underway. The terms of reference have been agreed uh, by the Committee of Procedures. The Assembly Commission doesn't want to prejudge or prejudice any of the outcome or outworkings of the discussions held by the Procedures Committee. So, the Commission is uh, looking forward to having a, a, a report from the Committee on Procedures and from the Assembly, and then we'll take that matter forward. Aaron, sir, Pat Sheehan. I call Pat Sheehan. Gormayoga, the free last concorda, a case to hack, question eight. And um, I call Jim Wells to answer question number eight. The Assembly Commission operates a guaranteed interview scheme for both internal and external recruitment competitions which offers a guaranteed interview to applicants with a disability. The scheme covers applicants with disabilities or those with long-term impairment or health conditions that are expected to last at least 12 months. And this means that they may, that they may, not, meet, they may not meet all the shortlisting criteria, but they will get an interview. In these circumstances, uh, the applicant uh, is able to demonstrate that he or she uh, has a long-term illness, then that is a, 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 a statement which will ensure an interview. The application form includes a section on disability and an applicant can indicate whether they wish to apply under the scheme and the basis on which they qualify. I should stress that the guaranteed interview scheme can only apply if the shortlisting criteria is met. It cannot guarantee an interview if an applicant does not meet the essential criteria for the post. 
The Assembly Commission is also mindful that some groups of applicants, including those with disabilities, may have different education experiences. Where appropriate, the essential criteria for a post will include two options. One option will relate to specific qualifications, and the alternative will be for a minimum period of experience in the area of work relevant to the post being advertised. Applicants with a disability can also indicate if they feel they require any reasonable adjustments to enable participation in the selection process. The member may also be interested to note that the Commission conducts an annual audit of disability for secretarial staff. If a member declares a disability, the member bring his remarks to a close? if a member de <laughs> declares a disability during the course of their employment, the Commission will review and make reasonable adjustments. I call Pat Sheehan for a supplementary. Irem Sir Pat Sheehan, Kesht Bresha. Gormagat August Boykasalation Ball as up to a regrunch and thank the member for his answer uh, there. Could he tell me if the Assembly Commission has engaged with any external experts, including disability rights groups? Gormagat. Jim Wells. Um, as far as I'm aware, we don't, but what I can report is that 9% uh, of our staff, 29 members, uh, w uh, of our staff currently employed by the Assembly have declared a disability. And I think that does give an indication that we're taking this seriously. Could I just go back to my previous answer, because I may well have misled him. Uh, the, the guaranteed interview only applies if you do meet the selection criteria. I may have indicated that there was a special dispensation. There isn't. But I think the Assembly is quite clearly trying to facilitate those with a genuine disability to get to the table, as it were, for an interview, and that we will make all reasonable adjustments for someone who is successful uh, once they do uh, secure employment. So I think the Assembly is making headway. There's more to be done, but I certainly think the fact that uh, such a large number of our staff have registered disabilities indicates we are taking this very seriously. I call Trevor Clark. Question number nine will be answered by uh, Commission Member Alex Ashwood. The Speaker, um, the Assembly Commission is certainly aware of the decision in the recent case, McCrossan and the Department for Social Development. Uh, as the member will be aware, and as I'm sure members will wish to respect, it is good practice and established practice of the Commission that it does not comment on personnel and human resource matters. So. Uh, given the question, it would not be appropriate to discuss the particular facts of the cases that have been raised. However, I can say to the member that the Commission does not consider that the facts in the Macrossan case uh, that revolved around use of social media are comparable to the cases of the Assembly staff to which the member refers and consequently does not propose to review the cases. I call Trevor Clark for a supplementary. And can I thank the member for that answer? In, in case there's any confusion, the case I am referring to was doorkeepers who did use it for social media purposes. So I think that the two cases are very similar. And for that reason, can, the, the, can the, I ask for an assurance? Sorry, can I ask again that the Commission would look at this case? Because many of us actually believe that a fact that I think this the case member has that it may made, actually be more bordering and religious discrimination. I think the member asked his question. Alex Ashwood. Uh, uh, I thank the member um, for the uh, supplementary question. Uh, the, what is uh, the same in both cases is it revolves around staff and social media. What is different in the two cases is that the policy of the Northern Ireland Civil Service in terms of its social media policy and its application to staff and the policy of the Commission in relation to social, policy, social media policy and its staff are different and therefore you cannot compare apples and oranges. There was a different policy in place in respect to the case involving DSD, and the tribunal came to a certain judgment in that regard. We have a different policy, and therefore whatever happened in another case does not necessarily or at all have reference back to the decision that was made by uh, management and the commission in this regard. Therefore, there is no precedent being set here in terms of the tribunal case in as much as it applies to the practice of the Assembly and the decisions made in these cases. Sorry, I can't be more helpful than that, but I think that that is the proper procedural and legal position. Nelson McCausland is not in his place. I call Justin McNulty. Question number 11. And Jim Wells will be answering question number 11. Annual pay awards are negotiated through NIPSA, who is the Assembly Commission's recognised trade union. 
The negotiations are, mari- are, are managed through a pay subgroup of the Employee, employee Relations Group, which is a joint industrial relations forum established by the Commission in conjunction with NIPSA. The pay claim for 2016 comprises a number of parts, including a claim for a consolidated percentage increase on all pay points, the reduction of pay points across all grades of staff, and enhanced leave entitlements. Negotiations in relation to the 2016 pay award are an advanced stage, and the details of the award was considered at the Commission meetings held on the 15th of November and the 24th of November. As part of that consideration, the Commission took into account a submission from a political party represented on the Commission in respect to secretarial pay rises. Justin McNulty, Lakesh Brescia. Justin McNulty for a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his answer thus far. Can the, can the member confirm which party made the submission? What proposals did it outline, and have the Commission agreed to any of those proposals? Well, that submission was made by the SDLP, uh, by Mr Alex Atwood, MLA, uh, who, who outlined what had occurred in other devolved institutions, particularly Scotland and Wales. Uh, Mr Atwood very eloquently at the Commission meeting put forward his view that we should follow a similar pattern as the other institutions. Uh, what I would say, however, remember that in the wider sphere, in health, education, agriculture, etc., we are generally imposing a 1% pay rise. And whilst the Assembly is a totally different entity, the Assembly Commission is not a branch of civil service, obviously the rest of our community will be watching to see what we do in terms of pay rises for our staff. And the obvious accusation would be that if we stepped out of line and paid our staff a higher increase, people would say, oh yes, they're quite happy to look after their own staff, but what about us? And that's the difficulty we face, the setting of a precedent for the rest of Northern Ireland. So that's where the negotiations are at the moment. Mr Atwood, without betraying any confidence of the Commission, took a different view, and he's perfectly entitled to do so, and that was fed into the overall um, decision-making process, which has not yet concluded, but that's the con- constraints in which we're acting under. Aram Sir Trevor Lon, I call Trevor Lon. Thank you very much, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number 12. Alex Ashwood is responding on behalf of the Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Da- uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And could I make it very clear to members that the Commission is not detached in any shape or form from the concerns of members arising from the independent review and the multiple consequences upon our staff, both current and previous, and all the other outworkings of that uh, 2016 determination. Um, when the uh, uh, Assembly established the Independent Financial Review Panel under the relevant legislation, the panel can also establish the criteria that must be met by each member in order to recover the costs of employing staff and support. This includes the criteria introduced in the 2016 determination that all support staff employed by members must be engaged on a standard contract of employment. The independence of that panel was established in the 2011 Act, and it states explicitly the Act specifies that the panel is not subject to the direction or control of the Commission or the Assembly. In that regard, it is a very high threshold of independence that the panel enjoyed and that we all live with the consequences of its recommendations. Um, The tenure of that panel ended in July and the Commission is currently considering what is the most appropriate model for the future delivery of financial support for members. All parties have been asked to contribute uh, to uh, what that might look like by the end of uh, January, I believe it to be. I'd encourage all parties to make their contribution to what the future review panel should look like. And Trevor Lund for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. I thank uh, Mr. Atwood for the comprehensive reply. Uh, but he agree with me that the situation around the employment of constituency staff is grossly unfair and flies in the face of employment law and wouldn't be tolerated in any other forum. And is he really satisfied that the Assembly Commission has no role to play in this matter, just just to be able to say, blame the IFRP, who don't even exist anymore? I think the members asked his question. Alex Ashwood. Um, Well, the technical and legal answer is 
that I have to and the Commission has to keep on the right side of the law and keep on the right side of the independence of the panel. Uh, and, and especially in circumstances where the law says that the panel is not subject to the direction or control of the Commission or the Assembly. And there's been history behind how we came to that place. We don't have to rehearse the history about how we came to that place. Uh, as I said, though, in my opening remarks, the panel or the Commission is not detached, uh, being MLAs themselves and representing the views of MLAs, is not detached from much of the sentiment of the member. Can members please take their ease while we change the table?